You know, today we are having a historical milestone in reporting. Another first one we had 22 years ago, because in 2000, uh, IFRS Foundation was was created. Why? We had major corporate scandals like Enron, MCI, Worldcom, Parmalat. And the markets and public lost totally the trust on the, on the financial reporting. And this is was done that, that we create the International Financial Reporting Foundation, which will be a non-profit public interest organization. I was then a commissioner in Brussels and tall man Paul Walker traveled to Brussels and said that we must have a seed change in the area. And so the IFRS Foundation was created and the EU decided to start to endorse IFRS standards. And they are the lingua franca of financial reporting today. I have standards that are used totally or partly in 200, 144 countries. And uh, we have US GAAP still parallelly but in main issues, they also uh, uh, are on the same line. What about sustainability at the time? Actually, Kyoto Protocol had been signed and ratified. But in 2000, uh, George W. Bush pulled out from Kyoto Protocol. So that even though we went further for financial reporting, sustainability reporting and financial reporting did not cross at the time. And so the Sustainable reporting landscape is quite, quite mixed and complicated. When we had financial crisis 2008, we, in the banking sector, we learned to talk about alphabet soup. There were so many acronyms, but nobody could really understand what was happening. We have not been far from this in, in, in sustainable reporting side. This confusion has led to a situation that there's a lot of talk, a lot of writing, very little strict analysis and comparability. A big risk is that this hot air will jump into everybody's faces. So voluntary initiatives have been good and positive, but the outcome is messy. Then we have jurisdictional initiatives, which are different, sometimes mandatory, sometimes not. But when capital markets are global, it doesn't make a difference because you know capital markets cannot compare every single jurisdiction. So this was state of play two years ago. And then the question was put to uh, IFRS Foundation that should we start to create sustainability disclosure standards? I mean, I decided that we, will, we are not fishing for new tasks because financial reporting is an immense task. That's enough for us. But if there's a genuine demand that we need global disclosure standards and IFRS, IFRS should play a role, we are ready for that. Close consultations read to unanimity for global standards, and quite many said that IFRS should play a role. So the turning point then became last November, that was COP26 in Glasgow. On finance day, 3rd of November, I was able to announce the three issues from the side of, of IFRS. But just to say that finance days was different. I have been in many of these climate meetings, and normally the key speakers are environment ministers, which is tremendously important. But now you had the finance ministers and central bank governors. So it became an issue of mainstream. And we, we made then three announcements, which were supported by IOSCO. IOSCO is international organization of securities regulators, because if you want to make something, something general and, and mandatory in the end, you need their support. They supported us and also G20 countries. And there were three pr proposals. First, establishment of the International Sustainability Standards Board. And the idea is that it will be parallel to Financial Reporting Standards Board. And their objective is to create a global baseline for sustainability-related financial disclosures. But one global baseline would be applied everywhere. That was announced. We also announced that it will be a genuinely global organization, global organization, co-located in Frankfurt, Montreal, and those two offices have been started, and we do a third one in Asia. First step. Second was consolidation of standard-setting organizations. If you want to get rid of this alphabet soup, 
must be able to consolidate this tremendous number of different organizations. That was perhaps the biggest news in, in uh, Glasgow that we succeeded there. And we are moving on so that the organizations such as SASP, VRF, CDSP and the others are merging to be part of IFRS Foundation. And third news was that to make it concrete, you must be able to announce prototypes. So what does this in practice mean in the end? These technically carefully prepared prototypes, what would be climate disclosure like? What would be general sustainability standard disclosure like were announced at the same time? So that was a big change and from that things have moved on very fast. Uh, on January, we were able to publish the nomination of the chair of the ISSB, French businessman Emile Fabre, who was to run, by the way, Danone. Deputy chair is former deputy chair from IASB, which is International Accounting Standards Board, which means that we have one business person working with sustainability, number one. Number two is somebody who has worked with financial reporting, so knows the interconnectivity between financial reporting and stage reporting. And th this, the number one and two got the right to publish first exposure drafts for new standards. And they were general requirements, exposure draft. And there you can see that what kind of standard structure is for the standard for corporate disclosures in the future. And second one is climate exposure standard, very much linked to what, what Anna was speaking. And they are now in consultation, so anybody can reply to them by, by the end of summer. What is the standard standards architecture? On the left you have the common thread, the four elements, I come back to that. On the right side, the idea is that there will be general requirement standard in general, and then we can have thematic standards like climate, and then also industry-based requirements, which are sector, sector based So what are these general requirements requiring? They require companies to provide material information on all significant sustainability-related risks and opportunities necessary to assess enterprise value. Because we are investor-focused in our work, we want to give investors a chance to assess the value of the company. So reporting must be transparent enough and substantial so the investors can assess the enterprise value. Then the other standards, uh, which are, which are sector-specific, such as climate or thematic, separately can set out specific disclosures. The structure of the standard is consistent with TCFD recommendations, which is Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. First, there will be, uh, the companies need to report their governance, what are governance processes, controls and procedures, and what the reporting entity uses to monitor sustainably related risks and opportunities. Then they need to present their strategy. If there are significant risks and opportunities, how company reacts to those? There are risks, but there can be also opportunities which technology can bring. If they are active, innovative, they can use technology as an advantage. Then they must be they present their risk, risk management strategy. And finally, metrics and targets. I'm sure that Anna will speak a lot about this in, the, in, the, in this modeling exercise, because if metrics is not enough, people need to understand what, how does it work in the basic concept. So this kind of structure is in all these in the, in the, in the standards in the future. Uh, so that's what proper company will disclose. And um, the ma main messages here are that there need to be consistency and connection between financial statements on one hand and sustainable reporting statements on the other hand, so that these linkages between the two can be explained and we must be able to use consistent uh, assumptions when, when relevant. And second point is actually what Anno mentioned, which is very critical, that once these standards are mandatory, the required, uh, uh, they will require companies to publish financial statements and sustainability disclosures at the same time. So in future, every quarter, parallelly, companies need to publish both. And that is something what investors have been demanding, and actually even CEOs. They say that when I go to the 
to the uh, press meeting to publish what the results, they anyhow ask both things. So it's better that they are reported at the same time and presented at the same time. Just one detail is that we don't say that what, what standard and what jurisdiction they should apply for sustainability. And the reason is there that we yet don't yet know what standards will be uh, uh, mandatory in what regions. So we let that for companies to choose. Some, some companies may want to show that they are able to apply even the higher standards than their local communities require. Key point here there is that this information, this disclosure, must provide enough information to enable the assessment of uh, the effects of sustainability related risks and opportunities, which means that investors are able to assess the value of the company. And focus is significant sustainability related risks and opportunities. So you should try to be on the right side on decimal, uh, left side on decimal, not the right one. To have the big picture which has impact on the on the value. And uh, all information which should include the impacts of a company on people, environment and the planet if they have an impact on the enterprise value. Because our focus is enterprise value, that is the key issue there. And that's why all information that is material should be disclosed. The second one, climate exposure draft, is now also in consultation the idea is that that will e incorporate then TCFD recommendations, so that this could merge to be one. The idea, in the long term, I hope that we can say that it's like Intel inside, you know, that when the transit is there, TFCD is inside. Some of you are aware of the SASP-related st standards. The, they also will be included here. That's one part of this consolidation. So disclosures need to tell information about physical risks, that transition risks, but also about climate-related opportunities which new technology can bring about. So, in the end, new standards will require to information that enables investors to determine the effects of climate-related risks and opportunities, to understand how company responds and what its strategy is for managing these risks, and to be able to evaluate the ability of the company to adapt its planning, business model and operations to climate-related risks and opportunities. So, that is the big picture. And just to say to you that, use your opportunity, these drafts are now on your website. And they are actually extremely, I can say, well-written. They are not written for bureaucrats, for preparers, investors, citizens. So you can see what kind of issue will be asked for companies to report. And when there are some, let's say, unclear issues, they also ask you alternatives. But if you read it all through, you know what kind of direction have been taken. But in your mind, I mean, I, I should start from the issue that in the end of the year will be a situation that we bought first two standards are ready. These general disclosure, standard, disclosure standards, which will be the rule of the game, Lingua Franco in the future, and second, climate disclosure standard. And we move on. And even though they are not yet mandatory, I expect that most advanced companies start to apply them relatively soon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Erkki. Um, really, really uh, exciting to hear, hear what's, been, what's been happening in the sidelines. May I still ask you, just given what the IFRS has been working on traditionally, like real financial data, at least I've, I've often like, run into the, the uh, question that when will impact data be as, as real as financial data? Was there any kind of like philosophical, you mentioned a little bit about the discussion, but were there any like people who, for example, um, uh, thought this should not be on the IFRS table at all? And who would have been then the organization to take, the, yeah, that, take on the a, challenge? That's a good point, because when the issue came to the table of trustees, many said, ah, far, <laughs> wonderful, we are thrilled, we take it over. <laughs> but no, if we say we want to have it, everybody mm. can resist. Mm. 
we don't accept any, f you know, those who are fishing for new tasks. Mm -hmm. So we are only there to serve. There must be demand and we are ready to serve. But you must be humble in the sense when you create something new. Mm -hmm. That's first issue. Second is, of course, that we don't have expertise on all sustainability related issues. We are great experts in financial reporting and on the interconnectivity. So we must be humble to use all the best expertise in the world. And what is happening now, it's very interesting that we are, we are now setting up this sustainability standards board. We have only nominated first two persons, but another seven, eight will be done in the next few weeks. How to balance their expertise. Mm -hmm. So it's global, sectorial, mm -hmm. scientific, financial is the big, big challenge. And also, of course, very inclusive in many ways. And it must be also global, so the other jurisdictions are taking into account. So it'll be more challenging than financial reporting. Financial reporting headquarters you can have in London and run it. But in sustainable reporting, if, if China is out, it doesn't really matter. You mm -hmm. need to be strong in Asia, you need to be strong in America, it's been stronger in Europe and Africa. So it's, uh, we are more humble, but I'm mean, terribly excited at the moment. <laughs> and I must say also, which has been interesting for me to see that the number of candidates who, who have applied for jobs, who are ready to serve, mm -hmm. has been an exceptionally high quality. Because mm -hmm. many people say that, you know, it's my time to serve. You know, they, have done, they have done their job somewhere they want to serve. But I'm, uh, I'm pretty happy with mm -hmm. the state of play. But still, apparently we need to have all kinds of networks with companies like you, mm -hmm. research communities, NGOs, mm -hmm. to create this kind of common knowledge base and common support also for the efforts we are working for. We are, we are, changing. We are, we are changing the world. Definitely. Have you already discussed the, the big question that I was uh, speaking about earlier about where to actually get the data? Will that be something that the private sector will then figure out, which probably will also make a lot of sense. Uh, but, but just uh, why I'm asking this is we've been discussing a lot with the EU and many of our clients and data users that are, that are uh, now trying to cook up the data points that the EU is asking from them. Uh, has there been any discussion in the IFRS, for example, about the need for macro models versus company disclosures and, and how this will unfold? Yes. Actually, you know, the, the chair of the task force, which uh, proposed this, that we establish the board, mm -hmm. has been Lucrezia Reichli, who is a very well-known professor of economics yeah. on the business school. And we are creating this kind of top-level academic expert group, helping in the conceptual work we need. Mm. And second, also a network of the top universities in the area. And the data is, issue is in the core, but you know, must get mm -hmm. first, you know, conceptually right. Yeah, definitely. And I must say, what you are doing here is, it's very excited and uh, exciting. It serves also well, but we must be careful. But I agree with you that if it's, it's not you know, you know, open base, mm -hmm. open source in the end, people don't trust it. So mm -hmm. you, you, you must have this base. Mm -hmm. In the end, companies may have their own interest also to be mm -hmm. more transparent. Because mm -hmm. if you tell that I'm wonderful, the others see you are not, you know, it's better, mm -hmm. better to give them the chance to check the data, how yeah. it works. But what you are doing, it's very, I mean, it's, it's very advanced. And, uh, but of course, our challenge is to, to make it in a way that it's global. So have a conceptual solution mm -hmm. which is clear, but then we can apply it everywhere. Because I come back to my point about Asia, that, that if we don't have China, India in, mm -hmm. in climate change, you know, you miss a big point. Definitely. You must yeah. keep all in, in your mind all the time that find this global baseline, which is applied everywhere, and then, of course, some jurisdictions can go beyond mm -hmm. in a way that they are still compatible. So, you know, they, are, yeah. they add a layer, a block. But we must keep also emerging and, and developing economies in the, world, in, in, in the part of this big, big story. Definitely. And it's a system. There should be global standards like, like from the IFRS. Yes. And there should be forerunners in the private sector that are already disclosing much more than what is required yeah. from them. And, that's and then there's also your stakeholder view. Of course, I said we are serving investor needs, but of course there are also other stakeholder needs which mm. are important. You know, citizens, uh, labor organizations, mm. human rights organizations, the others, and they, they are they are complementary. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have one global baseline, you can't make the difference. But you must uh, that must allow the others to build upon that, also for other objectives and for other audiences. Exactly. That was a great, great uh, summary and a, and a great uh, ending, ending for this section. Thank you so much, Erke. Let's you. give a, a one more uh, warm thanks for Erke Leipanen.